Well, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls and children of all ages, welcome to our penultimate episode of The Artist Heart Kilts, Castles and Haggis. In this episode, we leave the road and beautiful views to answer a question that many of you have been flooding us with. What is with the kilts? Where did they originate from? And what on earth is the history behind him? That plus I'll be showing you an Artist Heart exclusive, How I Painted Lady on the Lake. But that's not all, I'll be also showing you how kilts are actually made. That, that and so much more, so sit back and enjoy the show. Or if you like me, get out your paintbrushes and let's go, go, go. Okay folks, let's get right into things, shall we? Many of you have been asking the question, where on earth did kilts come from? Well, here to answer that question are two dudes who know a thing or two about kilts, our friends at USA Kilts. You want to go into the Lenya and all that and the back and forth on who's first and who's not? Yeah, start with kilts first and then, you know, let's define a kilt and start there and I'll pop in with the Irish stuff real quick. The, uh, uh, why, you know, where did they come from? If you... We're, we're all saying it kind of started as what we know as a kilt. Mm -hmm. It'll be like a great kilt, um, where it's literally just a, a length of cloth laid on the floor that you hand pleat, you lay down on, you belt up, and you roll around and tuck it in, and off you go. Um, it was basically an all-purpose utility thing. It was a sleeping bag. It was a blanket. It was pockets. It was a hood. It was, you know, whatever you needed it to be. Mm -hmm. When you're out in the, uh, you know, tending to the sheep and you're miles from home or, if, you know, if you're out herding cattle or whatever you can't necessarily get home right away or you may have to sleep in the fields so that's what you had with you so it was a very utilitarian garment mm -hmm. so if you're starting it there that's why the kilt came to be because they needed something and they didn't want to just carry a blanket and all these things they could just wear their wear their blanket wear mm -hmm. their house wear their jacket yeah Does that makes sense yeah and i think the, the the gray kilt is primarily considered to be a scottish invention um, the roots of it seem to be, as best as we can tell, a common Gaelic kind of a, a look, which both the Highlands in Scotland in the Middle Ages and Ireland possessed, which was uh, three basic garments. The lenya, or some people say lane, but I think it's lenya or lenya. Um, trues, which were the close-fitting trouser, kind of like tight-like pants. And then the brat, which is a kind of a cloak. So... We know that in the 16th century, there's evidence of uh, one of the early, in fact, the probably earliest mention of Scottish clothing, which probably intimated a great kilt, was of Scottish mercenaries going to fight in Ireland. And uh, the written account talks about how they're dressed in something similar to what the Irish wear, but not quite. And they have these large uh, cloaks that they belt around their bodies, which is unusual. And that's probably the first mention of a, of a great kilt. And that's from, I think, like 1520s. The, um, but the Lenya... Um, was basically a long tunic. That is that is the, the, the Irish contribution to world clothing. Uh, it was basically a, a long tunic. It varied in length and style over the centuries, but it was most famous as being the very long saffron-colored 
uh, tunic, which went down to the knees, sometimes below the knees. Um, towards the later period, it had a lot more voluminous fabric in it to the point that they were actually pleating it up in the back. Um, and it had these very, very long sleeves, kind of like if you think of like a, a girl's princess costume dress with a really long, pointy kind of sleeves. That's actually, historically, actually goes back to a number of different fashions, but the Lania had it. It's these long sleeves, more fabric showing off, more style, and more wealth, probably. Um, it seems that Highland Scots may have been wearing a very similar outfit to that up through, like, the 15th century or so. Or so. Um, and then, for whatever reason, the Scots decided to do something a little bit different. Both these cultures seem to like to go bare-legged. Uh, which I think is probably due to environmental conditions like mud and thistles and things, where it's just easier to have your legs open so you could keep your legs clean and not having fabric clinging to them. Would I thistles, don't know. If it was thistles, I would think that you'd want to wear you'd, pants I, yeah. and not getting scratched up. Yeah. Um, but if you're if you're fording rivers and streams on a regular yeah. basis, maybe you wouldn't. Or if you're sweating a lot, maybe you wouldn't. I don't know how much you it sweat was, in the highlands. It's pretty well, cool. It's... it's you know what I mean. Reasonably, yeah. I'm thinking more like water and things like that. I think it's, it's water related. It'll dry off yeah. quicker I think, versus yeah. if you're if you think about If you think about brogues and bog shoes with all the holes and everything so yeah. the water can drain out, I really think it's I think it's the water yeah. aspect. It's, it's more comfortable. Too. Now, my personal opinion is that the brat, the, the, the mantle that both areas wore but the Irish were more famous for, maybe that's what evolved into the Great Kilt. Like a brat's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and eventually some guy's like, heck with it. I'm going to belt this thing and I'm going to wrap it around myself a little differently. That's that's my personal opinion. Um, it's a slightly murky topic, uh, but the earliest evidence we have for the kilt, the great kilt, is that Scottish 16th century. Uh, Matt Newsom, as usual, Matt Newsom, um, has a really good article on this stuff on his website called Albanach. And that's one place where I got my information from, and I highly recommend you read it. Cool. All right. Hopefully that answers the question. And then there's evolution of the kilt beyond that time period in Scotland. That's pretty much entirely Scottish. Yeah, and then it's once it gets cut into the half kilt or fill a bag, um, which is effectively the tailored garment that we're wearing today. Mm -hmm. um, that is an entire its entire own evolution. Right. Um, and then touching quickly on the that came before you know th that as a garment came before the Irish half kilt, which was pretty much the Saint Edna's score. Ed Enda's school yeah. um, in the turn of the century with the Gaelic revival and the mm -hmm. the uh, the Inc or Irish trying to be separate right. from the English. They took the Scottish kilt and and made it Irish to basically flip off the English. Yep. Essentially. Yep. Yeah. And that's why the Irish kilts, early traditional Irish kilts, traditional meaning early 1900s, were solid color, and you still see saffron color and blue and green solid color kilts for the Irish. Yep. The Irish tartans were invented in the mid 1990s. Yep. Hey folks, and welcome to another Art from the Heart exclusive. In this video, you're gonna to get to see how we put together a very, very special commission. And this is somewhat of a more spiritual nature. Um, and the, the premise on this commission is it's going to be full of sunset colours and there'll be a, a, a lady that's in the side of a boat that's just touching the water and you've seen the ripple effects that it has. Um, and this is something that, you know, obviously in a giant canvas like this, we can do something really, really special with. So I wanted to give you a behind the scenes glimpse and look at how we put this one together. So come on in and let's begin. Still on my mind 
Your many dreams have passed At the times of all of you It's gonna take some time To realize just how to move on It's gonna take some time So long, it's time to move on. Yeah, it's gonna take some time to walk out into a brand new day of life. Teaching what I love, waiting me, inspired. So now that we've got all the basics down and everything, we're going to leave this painting to dry. We'll be back in a few minutes, but before we do anything else, let me show you how kilts are made. Each different tartan pattern or set is woven from crisscrossing coloured threads called the warp and the weft. The warp runs lengthwise and it's Jimmy Hill's job to make it. The warp threads must follow the exact sequence required to create the tartan that's been ordered up. Each thread has to go to the exact place of that pattern. Once Jimmy has put each of the 240 coloured yarns in the right order, he threads them onto a revolving drum at the warping mill. With all the threads tied in, Jimmy starts the mill. The warp is perfectly sequenced, but it's only half done. To make a symmetrical pattern, Jimmy now has to complete the sequence by creating a mirror image. To do this, he cuts the threads and then rotates them to invert the pattern. Jimmy now has to join the two halves without getting in a tangle. He repeats the process until he has a two meter wide, 32 meter long strip. Jimmy's warp isn't yet cloth, for that, it needs the weft, which runs sideways. The thread is fed from this machine, called a weft accumulator. It must be kept at just the right tension. The threads then pass through these weft selectors. Each arm controls a different color. They work like keys on a piano. A different tune means a different kind of tartan. And they're told what to play by a central computer. To make space for the incoming weft threads, these shafts separate the warp thread. Meanwhile, these warp droppers constantly monitor the threads. If a warp dropper drops, it means a thread has broken and the whole weaving machine slams to a halt. Every day, this mill weaves 600 meters of tartan. That's enough to make 82 traditional kilts. But that's only a fraction of the material needed to clothe the millions of modern-day descendants of Scotland's ancient clans. Wow, oh, wow, wasn't that exciting, boys and girls? Well, we've got a painting to finish, so let's get on with the lady on the lake.
this season of The Artist Heart. That's it. We're done. We're finished. Hope you've really, really enjoyed it. And... I'm filming. I'm filming. It's... What? Excuse me a minute, folks. Come here. What? There's another episode. What do you mean there's another episode? We're done. We're finished. Twelve episodes, see? No, look. Thirteen. We're done. Seriously, don't push it. We've done, you know... Kilts, castles, haggis. We've taken a round, we've shown them Scotland, they've enjoyed it, they've loved it. Just just leave it at that, okay? <laughs> two, two minutes, guys. What do we do? This episode 13. See, Loch Lomond. Go on, you need to tell them about it. <sighs> hi, hi, folks. Okay, uh, my uh, director is telling me that there is actually another episode. There's a 13th episode. In all seriousness though, there originally was a 13th episode. Uh, it was to feature Lot Lomond and it was to be the, the ultimate special, the finale for The Artist Heart Season 3. Unfortunately, that episode never materialised and the original footage has been lost. But, thanks to our good friends at YouTube, and with the uh, technology, I suppose, that we have now, we've created something really, really special for you that I think you're going to absolutely love. So next week is our ultimate, ultimate finale for the Honest Hunt Series 3 Kilts, Castles and Haggis. And here's a little preview of what you're going to get to see. <laughs>